From the family grocery hauler to fire-breathing racing engines, the one name you need to know is USA Motor and Machine, located at 51 Cleveland Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. Give them a call at 615-726-3725 or at usamotorandmachine.com. Well, NASCAR did the right thing and overturned the penalties. Didn't take them all away, but they did do the right thing. Darlington ran this past weekend. We've got a national USAC event in Nashville this weekend. Hmm, bet you didn't know that. And a great race at Highland Rim. All that and much more. Coming up next with Larry Woody on Pit Pass. Jeff Meeks and Chris Austin invite you to watch your favorite sports event at the Batter's Box at 43 Hermitage Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. The Batter's Box offers shuttle service to all Titans home games. It's a great place for friends to gather for the game and after the game. So check out the Batter's Box Bar and Grill and thanks again for sponsoring the show. Talkopolis, the social media TV network for your city. Well, welcome in everybody to Pit Pass. I'm Joe Williams along with my idol, Larry Woody. And You're I, not going to sing on the air, are you? No, no, I promise. We did Joe before. was singing a minute yeah, ago. Yeah, I promise not to do that. <laughs> um, Larry Woody, longtime uh, writer. You are still writing. I'm still writing. <laughs> They'll have to pry my cold hands off my <laughs> off my uh, typewriter. So still still using the old Royal Manual. No, I've actually got a word processor. Really? I don't like it. It's, with the typewriter, you, when you when you made a mistake, which I did every other line, you just ripped the <laughs> ripped the paper out and threw it away. It felt good just to tear it out. Oh yeah. <laughs> this you got to hit a little button and it just deletes everything. I, I like to, to physically rip it out and tear it up and throw it in the trash can. But yeah, anyway, I I'm, say, I'm still pecking. Yeah, where, still where, pecking we had, away. where we had planned to go on this, <laughs> we've already know. gotten away yeah, from. Never mind. As far as our, our show it notes. It started when you were singing. Well, that's true. But, you know, I, okay. I always laugh. When, when I think about computers at racetracks, I always think <laughs> when Larry Woody covering uh, for the Tennessee uh, brought his first Radio Shack TRS-80 yeah. to the racetrack, yeah. We put, had to put in a phone line and watching him on Saturday nights trying uh, to hold that coupler oh, that awful. to the oh. phone. I think it ran on hamsters. If you took the top off inside, there were little hamsters that ran on a wheel. And that's, that's how old it was. I can say, but there were times uh, apparently they didn't feed the hamsters and, before you got it. And Joe, the trouble with those old computers, they were terrible spellers. I can't tell you how many times I'd write a story and the computer would have words misspelled and just the copy all screwed up. They were really, really bad for that. Well, this goes to prove people don't misspell. Computers, computers misspell it. Okay, gracious. Let's get back right. to where we were back headed. To <laughs> There's more good news, if you will. Uh, Larry, I think the National Stock Car Commission got it right uh, on the appeal of penalties by Joe Gibbs Racing. Uh, some very draconian penalties handed yep. down by NASCAR <coughs> and a three-member panel that included uh, Dennis McGlynn, the CEO at Dover Motorsports, yep. said, guys, you've gone too far. Uh, they removed the 50-point penalty. Uh, for the driver points, knocked yep. it down to 12. They removed uh, the owner point penalty from 50, knocked it down to 12. The money yep. stayed the same. Yep. The biggest thing that I really thought would change, mm -hmm. and and I just could not see them going through this without some kind of even legal action, and that was the, uh, the quote, suspension yep. of car owner Joe Gibbs for six races yep. and the team could get no points for those races. I just I could not see that happening. Too too severe for the for the infractions. You know, like we said a couple of shows ago, it's like getting the death penalty for jaywalking. You know, the, the teams committed an infraction, but the penalties were too severe for that those particular infractions. I thought. I mean, we're talking about you know centimeters, and it it and as NASCAR said, it didn't the, the stuff that they got caught doing or not doing in some cases didn't really affect the, the race or the performance of the car. It's just really technical stuff. Yeah. So I thought justice was served. I thought NASCAR made a made a point by saying by serving notice, and this is that's mostly what it's about, Joe. Just serving notice to the teams that we're not going to play in this gray area. You've got to we've got strict rules. You've got to abide by them strictly. Then NASCAR having done that, I thought the the commission gave NASCAR a, a way out out by saying, okay, you, you made your point, but you made it a little too strongly. Let's ease up just a little. So I, I thought I thought it was a win-win-win, NASCAR, the commission, and the, and the teams that were involved. Yeah, and this one was a little bit different, Larry, in that, to, to recap what happened, Matt Kenseth wins a race. They send the car to the R&D center, as they do for every race, yeah. and uh, they literally take everything apart piece by piece, and the connecting rods one of the eight connecting rods was two and a half grams lighter than the specification. Yeah. Now, 
two and a half grams. Two and a half grams. <laughs> That's a, yeah. if, if, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a cocaine guy, I guess it matters, but to us, who cares? Yeah. But It's you know. like they said, Joe, if they, if they hadn't waited till the dust settled on it, it would have passed. It passed, but yeah. It, the dust settled, and that, that made it too heavy. Say overall, yeah. for a whole, you know, they, they were more, the average was more than what it needed to yeah. be. Yeah. Where I'm headed here is, I think the difference in this case, Larry, I'm not sure they sent a message as much to the teams as they mm -hmm. did to the manufacturers. And what I mean yeah. by that is, all the Toyota engines come from one specific yeah. builder yeah. in California. <laughs> uh, it's not like the old days. You know, in the old days, they mm -hmm. used to have, every team had an engine builder, every team yeah. had an engine shop. Yeah. Um, now you've got about three or four big players yeah. that are supplying engines to everybody. And that was the same deal, I think, that Joe Gibbs guys were caught with. The same deal. They said all, all we did is took a, yeah. the stuff out of the box and put it on the car. Exactly. And uh, But again, NASCAR's point may have been, like you said, Joe, to the people who, who put the part in the box back at the, the factory, you know, get it right or you're not going to play in NASCAR. So, again, I think their point was, uh, I think they wanted to make a point. I think they made a point, and I don't think we'll see much of that, any of that in the past because NASCAR said, look, we're really going to, we're going to call it, call it closely. I was going to say, now, one of the things that the commission did do, which I thought was, or the appeals board, I guess, that I thought was really interesting, kind of follows along with that point, Larry. The manufacturers fight every year for the, manufacturer's title. Which is a big deal. It's a big deal to Only them. to manufacturers. Well, yeah. the, the fans probably don't care as much as they used to in the old days. Yeah. But it, it's a big, big deal to the manufacturers. Well, which actually, is why they put sure. all this money into oh, it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, they actually increased the penalty yeah. on manufacturer points from five to seven. Hmm. So, I mean, that's a 40% increase in penalty. Maybe. Which, which is fine because apparently from everything we've read, it's a, it was their Manufacturer fault. Manufacturer issue, sure. yeah. yeah. It was their fault, so penalize them. And again, it's a, it's only a big deal. The manufacturer's trophy is only a big deal to the manufacturers. But to them, it, it's a big, big, big deal. So, you're right. Now, uh, owner's points, too, you know. Sure. Uh, the fans, I, I'm not sure, Joe, the fans really get caught up in the owner's points. 99.9% I, I, .9 of the fans' focus is on the driver's championship exactly. and the driver's points. Some some carry over maybe to the owner's points, but I, I don't think it's that big a deal. I don't. I think it's more of a an insider thing, you know, matter of pr pride, that kind of thing. The, and the, a little the money. Team. It's, yeah, money involved, too, which the owners don't turn down. But most of, you, most of your, your, your fan focus, media focus, is on the driver's points and the championship. And those were uh, affected too. You know, those, those were some pretty tough penalties to Brad Keselowski and uh, and Logano. You know, yeah. that could have had, particularly for Logano, that uh, after 26 races, that might have been the difference in Logano being in or out of the chase. Exactly. So, uh, big big deal for uh, and, on driver's point. I was going to say you kind of worry about that for uh, <coughs> for Matt Kenseth too. But yeah. Larry, he kind of served notice <laughs> that he's not worried about it. He just went out and won the race at Darlington this past week. That's what drivers used to say. Instead of worrying about points, go out and win races, and the points will take care of themselves. Right. And Joe, it's interesting. You pro could probably win some bar bets or or trivia uh, bets. Who's the winningest driver at this point in the season? Matt Kenseth, Kenseth. got three wins, and uh, he's like a stealth bomber. Joe, Matt is so low key; he flies under the radar. He doesn't make any waves. He goes out, he w leads laps, he wins races. He doesn't rattle any cages, and he's uh, like I say, he's kind of the stealth bomber of NASCAR. But he's a good little driver, good, great driver. Not just good; he's a great driver. Switches teams and doesn't miss a beat. You know, some people said he made a mistake leaving uh, Jack Roush, where he'd spent his entire Cup career. Goes over to Joe Gibbs and is the winningest driver at this point in the season. I'm gonna say he's already won more races this year yeah. than he won last year with. I, I believe I Matt probably had a pretty good idea of what he's doing when he made the move. What'd you think of the Darlington race? Boring, uh, huh? I, bored to tears, Joe. For for Darlington, I, I I kept wondering if maybe I was watching a replay of some of the California, <laughs> some of those 1.5 mile cookie cutter tracks. I, it's the most. And my, a buddy of mine came over and watched it with me, Joe. We agreed. It's the most boring Darlington race I've ever seen. I, I just, uh, and they kept going on, uh, our buddy Daryl and the radio guys, about, man, it's how impressive it was. They were, set, they were on course for a record average speed of the race. Joe, when you have a high average, rate, uh, average race speed, that means it's probably a boring race because all, that doesn't have anything to do with actual racing speeds. That means there aren't many cautions and the average speed goes up. If you have one caution for litter on the track, your, your famous call at the fairgrounds, <laughs> one litter on the track can just destroy the average speed sure. of the race because, again, it doesn't have anything to do with how fast the cars are going. Really, it has to do with how few caution flags there were and there weren't any at Darlington. That meant there wasn't a whole lot going on. 
Does that mean that the skill is that much better? Uh, the equipment's that much better than it used to be? Or is it just everybody's playing follow the leader in points racing already? All of the above. I, I think it's all of the above. Now, having said that, a couple of weeks ago, you know, we, we had, let's see, where did the race two weeks ago? It was a great race. Talladega. Yeah. A, a great race at Talladega. One of the best we've had. Then we go to Darlington, another tough old track, and guys just, just boring you know you could hear the the snores coming from the grandstands but that's going to happen occasionally oh yeah you every, have a, every racetrack yeah. is going to have one of those occasionally yeah. where it's just not you know it's they went out they raced and they're done it just like you used to have bad super bowls went through sure. a stretch where the nfl had three or four snoozers for super bowls and uh, so it, it is that's part of sports competition sometimes you have a lot of drama and excitement sometimes you have a snoozer in darlington nobody's fault was a snoozer I think things will perk up, though. Did you fall asleep in the middle of it? Oh, almost. I, 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 usually I keep a book at my, my, <laughs> my, my, my desk, and I'll, I'll watch the race, and when something happens, I'll look up, and when yeah. they're just running in circles and droning on, I'll read for a while. Unfortunately, I think Darlington uh, probably <coughs> epitomizes, from, <coughs> from what we've seen, what has become the anthem <coughs> of, of NASCAR yeah. fans in the last five years, and that is watch the first ten laps. Yeah. Watch the last ten laps, and that's only You're twenty laps well you see. Yeah, you used to say that about NBA basketball games. Watch the tip off, and then tune in for the last three minutes, and you've seen most of it. Uh, NASCAR Joe's, you know, didn't used to be like that. There was something going on almost all, all through the race. Some, something somewhere, even pit stop. You know, NASCAR didn't have any timeouts or quarters or half times or anything. So there's usually something to follow all through the race, whether the some guy up front like Yarborough used to or Petty was running away with the race, there'd be a good race for second, third, fourth on back Somewhere. in the field. But it's almost comical at Darlington the other night, Saturday night, the, the cameramen were frantically searching back through the field to try to get two cars in the same frame. <laughs> and it, it was pretty pretty hard to do. You know. That may be the best uh, place uh, to end this segment, right? I had to get a wide <laughs> angle shot to actually get two cars Need together. A fish eye. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, again, it's kind of comical. The TV guys, at one point, somebody passed somebody for 38, and they got excited about what a great battle it was. They're, they're, they're running side by side. <laughs> but anyway. Sometimes you got to do that, Larry. Well, Sometimes some, you, in the booth, you, you, you got to do you that. You do what you got to do. As, yeah, pick. As, as you've, you pick, as you've yeah. done a few times yes, before. Yes, sir. You years. pick your battles. You know, you pick what you get out there. All right. Coming up next, we're going to talk with a couple of up and comers. And I mean, they're. These are young young plants, young flowers that are going to grow, I guess. Tomorrow, uh, superstars. Yeah, exactly. And where are they coming from? Well, it's not from our local racetracks per se. It's out of the USAC, Quarter Midget Association. There's a big national event coming up here in Nashville. We're going to talk about that next on Pit Pass. Today's show is brought to you by locally owned and operated Highland Rim Speedway. Visit their website at highlandrim.com. Welcome back, everybody, to Pit Pass. I'm Joe Williams, along with Larry Woody. And, Larry, we often talk about the future of racing, not just here, but across the country. Well, coming up this weekend, uh, folks, there is a national USAC event. Larry, it's unfortunate that uh, a lot of folks don't remember what USAC. At one time, the United States Auto Club was the only sanctioning body. Yep for automobile races in the United States. Of course, some others have sprung up, and, and USAC for years uh, was the sanctioning body for the Indianapolis 500. Yeah. They have been uh, really serious in open wheel racing forever. Well, the starting point in open wheel racing now is young. How young? Yeah, Introduce our guests. We're gonna find out yeah. how young. We do have a couple of special guests with us. On my far right is Grayson Pate. Grayson, you're how old? 10. Ten. Ten. And you're racing. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. He's partially lost his mind. <laughs> Dylan Fetcho is on my right. Dylan? Twelve. Ten and twelve. Well, Dylan's obviously over the hill, so... Yeah, I was going to say, he's, <laughs> he's past his prime. And of course, to a little background, we covered Dylan's dad, Scott, out at the fairgrounds, so it's... You, you got good racing DNA, Dylan. That's right. <laughs> but, uh, you guys, tell, tell, tell our audience guys a little about the quarter midgets and how you got involved in it and what, what all is involved when you'll be racing this weekend. Um, um, I got my first quarter midget from Santa Claus when I was five, I think. Yeah. And then I've been racing since then. And what about? I've been, I got mine when I was five. My dad bought it and then I've been, well, I got it when I was four and a half, went out and practiced. I've been racing ever since I got turn five. What's the fun of it, guys? What do you like about quarter midget racing? 
passing. The speed, the excitement, meeting yeah. girls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a little, maybe a little early for oh, that okay. one. But <laughs> you'll learn. But it is, it is funny. I was talking mm -hmm. to your dad. You know, he, he said, uh, one, one thing I like about it is you're not sitting home playing video games. You're out, outside doing something, getting some, you know, some exercise and doing something you enjoy and working on the cars and tinkering. So it, it, it's a good, good activity. Grayson, you ever get nervous? Uh, sometimes. When? Like before, the, like sometimes before the race, and there's a lot of people. I'm always like, oh, I gotta, gotta make it, gotta make it. And then when I do, I'm all happy and I'm running around. It's kind I'm of what, fun. kind of what they'll face this weekend. Two hundred and thirty drivers are currently entered, uh, entered from well, around the country. Way, but if they're from literally from around the country, uh, Michigan, Ohio, points north and south. Um, that's at the moment. Obviously, that number could yeah. increase. Uh, that's in 13 different divisions, and only 10 will make the feature on Sunday. We're going to go through the schedule here in a minute. So that means 100 or more of these folks are coming in, <clears throat> going to spend time here, going to spend money here, eat, shop, stay. Good for the economy. Yeah, and, but 100 of them are going home a little bit early. Uh, Dylan, does that bother you that there's that many cars coming in? A little bit, but not so much because it's my home track. So I'm used to the track. You love the pressure. Bring them on, right? Yeah. <laughs> now you guys will race in different categories, I take it. Yeah. Yes, sir. How long before you race against each other? Uh, until mm -hmm. the next point race, because I race light 160 with him in point races. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you do race against each other mm -hmm. occasionally. All right, so who wins? Well, <laughs> kind of there's a, well, to be honest, there's this one kid, he's incredibly fast, and me and him are both chasing him. Speaking of chase, Andy Johnson's son chases, yep. Chase races mm -hmm. seven there. I think he's he's an old man at age seven, but I guess he'll, <laughs> and Andy's son, Chase, will probably be out there with you guys. How, how fast these carts go? On, I know there's different different divisions, but yeah. the top top level, Dylan, I guess you're probably, how fast does your cart go? They probably go around 55 or so. 55. And that's a small track, if you think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 50, on that track, it's It looks like you're going to 155. <laughs> I was out there, guys, a few years ago, covering doing a feature for the Tennessee, and what struck me was, I was out there, and it looked like a Sprint Cup garage when these haulers and trailers yeah. start coming in. I was talking to Scott, Dylan's dad, and he says some of them have their own mechanics, technicians, people who travel with the teams to work on the, the cars and tune up the engines and so forth. So you guys are, you're a, it, it's a big league sport, isn't it? Oh, yeah. big, big time sport. Yeah. Big time sport. Do you do? Who does your work? You guys tinker with them yourselves, or your your, your dad and yeah. his friends do it. Or dad, but dad. sometimes sometimes yeah. I may help with it, but mostly my dad does it. So he rolls up his sleeves and goes to work. Huh? <laughs> How and my you? some of my uh, some of my my uncle and some of my family members come and help on it too. So he gets a few volunteers mm -hmm. lined up. So, how much are you learning doing this about about the cars themselves? Oh, well, you learn a lot. Yeah. If you, you guys get to mess with the setups. I mean, you you learn about shocks and tires and right sides mm -hmm. and left sides and all that already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dylan, besides your dad, who's your racing hero? Do you have somebody you watch on television or grew up watching at the old fairgrounds, or um, is it somebody you, probably you like? Alex Bowman in ARCA. Who's that? Um, it's a guy that. The guy that owns my race car, it's his son's friend that he used to race quarter inches against, okay. and he's Alex on he's Baldwin. on TV now. I heard it. Well, what about the the, the Cup guys? Anybody? Uh, a Jeff Gordon or a Dale Earnhardt? You're, you're too young to remember Richard Petty, but uh, yeah. <laughs> is there somebody on the Cup level that you'd like to watch race or think I'd like to be in his place someday? Yeah, uh, Jeff Gordon and Jimmy Johnson. Oh. And? Uh, well, I don't really want to do the NASCAR. I want to do the Indy cars. No. Well, you must you must be a fan of uh, Joseph Newgarden then out of out of Hendersonville. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Well. You about anybody in the Indy car circuit you like when you watch any, any favorites? Mm -hmm. You just like them all. Mm-hmm. Not like, that. So you'll be racing at Talladega when you're racing at the Brickyard, Dale, yeah. won't you? Mm-hmm. Let's speak. Kurt Busch. Yeah. Passed his rookie test yeah, this year. Yeah. Uh, you, you can do both. You know that, right? Yeah. I mean, there've been lots of drivers who've done both. He's not interested not at all. Go, he, wants, not go. he wants that open wheel Indy car. <laughs> right. Now, quarter midgets, let's talk a bit about the cars. You, we've all seen uh, uh, the, the sprint cars and the, the, uh, you know, the winged wild outlaw kind of things. These are literally quarter-sized 
um, racers. Little race cars. Little, uh, yeah, I mean, it's the Bobby Hamilton <clears throat> Jr.'s yeah. daughter uh, is, is big in this thing. They're having a lot of fun with it. Deborah Renshaw Parker's son yeah. is big in this thing. Andy Johnson's son. Andy Johnson's son. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of second generation drivers coming through. There's a lot of uh, uh, young guys coming through. Now, I guess, is there, do you ever get tired of it? I mean, you're young. There's some other things I know going on. Do you ever get sick of it or tired of it? Or no, nope. not really. It's always exciting. Because you, you don't envy your, your your friends sitting home playing video games or uh, watching TV. Yeah. Yep. You, oh, you did. Oh, you do. <laughs> no, you wouldn't be there. You wouldn't swap with them, though, would you? No. You'd no. really be on the racetrack. I was say, now, Larry, I, I got to tell them a little bit because this morning when they came in, we were we were talking everything. I noticed Peyton uh, was explaining to Dylan with his phone how to beat different levels of something. So apparently there's there's a game on a phone somewhere that they're kind of hooked During up During the with. intermission, you can explain to me how to work one of those things. Larry's talking about the phone part. <laughs> yeah, I, I still don't know how to do it. He, he, he doesn't know about the game. He's talking about the phone part. Guys, is it ever scary out there? I know we're, we're talking lower level, but it's a pretty fast speed. Like you said, around 50, 55 on a little track. Does it ever get a little, little tense for you? Oh, yeah. Well, sometimes um, when you're going for a pass, a guy may actually try to go back under you, and when you go into the corner, he may accidentally clip you, and you'll go flipping over the wall and land and So you flipped over down. the wall? Yeah, I've done it before. Yeah. It's got to be a fun ride. At seven years old. Yeah. <laughs> was it a fun ride? Uh, kind of. I was happy that the car wasn't broke. Everything was fine. Guys, uh, along, along that line, these, these are, this is pretty, uh, very safe racing. I mean, considering that you're going as fast as 50, 55 miles an hour, they do a good job with the, with the cars, don't they? Mm -hmm. They've oh, yeah. got the roll oh, cages, yeah, yeah. and like I say, it, it's professional. These are not something that you and I would nail together in the backyard. These are high-tech racing machines, little yeah. racing oh, machines. Yeah. Now, these kids are truly blessed because the facility here in Nashville, yeah. now it's just off, you go out to Lebanon Road and make a ride on uh, Central Pike, about the time you get to the railroad tracks it, it's kind of back in a in a field if you will you gotta gotta go back a little bit but uh, it's conveniently located but it can be hard to find fine. yeah you have to there'll be plenty of signs this weekend but uh, mr pete barnett went out and said you know i want to do something for the kids and i love racing and he's carved out this fantastic facility that may be larry the best un the best mm -hmm. secret in all of nashville when it comes to racing it's kind of nestled off the beaten path. It, like I say, it's easy to get to. You just go out Lebanon Pike and turn right. And I think Mr. Barnett, I, I, I interviewed him once. I think his grandson was a racer and didn't have a place to race. And I think he went out and kind of built a track for, for him. And the current owners here, you can probably fill us in on some of that. But I think they got a website, too, if people want directions, information, that kind of thing. Or might have a son or daughter. Yeah. Daughter or grandson, granddaughter who's interested in checking it out. They could get the information off uh, the website. Now they're, they're pretty strict. USAC is pretty straightforward about how big racetracks can be and I mean uh, they call this place Little Talladega for a reason because for you guys this is pretty pretty big racetrack. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Got banks and everything. Yeah. I mean it's, it's, it's a it high bank for, paved, for what they're doing. Paved, paved, yeah. It's amazingly it's fun. We all always sometimes in the national races we'll get three wide going down the straightaway. Yeah I mean it's, we went out last year. Malcolm West and I went out last year and watched some of this and we were truly impressed. Now yeah. Uh, the other thing is, this is a national event this weekend, but you guys mm -hmm. race on a pretty regular basis out there. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Usually yeah, we we'll race every other weekend. Every other weekend. For points, we usually yeah. race, and then we'll have a week off and race. Do you guys race anywhere else, or just the local track here in Nashville? Oh, uh, well, there's other tracks. There was a series that they went around, and we actually raced inside the brickyard. It was fun. Inside I go up to sure. I go up to Ohio a lot. Mm. Oh yeah, it's an indoor track. Indoor, yeah, it's that fun. is fun. Wow, on the on the circuit. Already, <laughs> yeah. Look at this; they've already started and already been to the brickyard. All right, now practice starts Friday. They'll open things up at five o'clock. Run practice from five to eight on Saturday. They start at nine a.m. with two hundred and thirty plus cars in thirteen divisions, and throughout the day, from qualifying races and this kind of thing, they will narrow that down to ten in each division and the features, the A-mains as they call them, will start Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. Uh, this is open to the public. It's free. You don't have to pay to see this. I mean, Mr. Barnett said, hey, open it up, bring everybody out. Uh, they do have concessions on site, by the way. Uh, Did you give the website address? Not yet. It's, uh, if, you want, if you want more information, you can go to MCQMRA, that's a Music City, quarter midget racing association dot com 
And I'll bet Aaron's going to put that on the screen before this is all done. Uh, unless we said they're off uh, Central Pike out in Hermitage. It's a great little facility. Now, guys, this is Nashville. If you win at Nashville, you're supposed to get a guitar. Would you like to have one? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Franklin American Morgan and some other guys uh, helped put this thing together. Nicely done. It's another. Let me, I'm going to grab this and do this and see. You know what? I'm going to I'm going to block my boys here for a second and see if we can come in close on that. Dylan, you're getting the short end of this, partner. <laughs> I got to tell you, but this thing is absolutely beautiful. Now, Mr. Woody asked a great question earlier. If you were to win one of these, what would you do with it? I would not crush it like Kyle Bush did. That's my man. That's all I wanted to eat. That's the right answer. That is the correct answer in Nashville. Peyton, would you put it in your room and hide it? Well, no, not really. My grandpa, he can tune it up and I can play it. You play? No, but I would like to learn. You'll learn, yeah. I was just saying. It'll happen. Guys, and on this level, it, it's all trophies, isn't it? It's, you, you get you get trophies. We winners. get medals most of the time, but we, get, we can get medals, trophies, yeah. too. Yeah. Usually for first place, you get a trophy, and then second and third are medals. you got a pretty good collection going, too, I guess, hadn't you? Yep. <laughs> Dad built you a trophy case? Yeah, my uh, grandpa did. All right. Will this fit in it? No. I'd have to hang it on the wall. Yeah. Gra grandpa, I, I guarantee you, Grandpa would you'll find, make you'll one find in a place. You got one, wouldn't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I thought the best trophy was is at the brickyard. The trophy was a brick. Yeah. That's pretty yeah, that good. That makes sense. Brick, yeah. You got a medal for, like, first place it was like a gold medal, and then for second it was a silver medal, then for third it was like a bronze medal, and then you got the brick. The brick. It's not bad. It was awesome. It's not bad. They're copying us, Larry. Yeah. They're copying Nashville. <laughs> they do it all over the world, and bad. they're still doing it. Gentlemen, thank you for being here today. I know it was tough to get out of school to come in. Uh, that had to hurt a little bit, but, you know. You can make it Look up. Look at them. They're not going to say a word. They know better. And, and someday, Joe, these tapes, they'll be in the archives somewhere, and people will look and say, there was Jimmy Johnson Jeff Gordon sitting yeah. there being interviewed. So. Yeah. I was going to say, guys, because this is digital. Ago. You know, once once it's out there on the Internet, it stays forever. Say thank you to Al Gore. No. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, guys, and be careful out there. All right. Well, thank Dylan you. Fetcho, Grayson Pate, Larry Woody. Guys, thank you so well, much. Good luck this weekend. Thank you. It's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The A-Mains out at uh, the Music City Quarter Midget Track just in Hermitage, just off Central Pike. Uh, never know who you'll see out there. A lot of folks will show up that yeah. you don't even expect. It's a good event, fun event. Yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be big, and it's going to be good for the economy in Nashville. When we come back, Larry and I will wrap up this edition of Pit Pass. Stay with us. Today's show is brought to you by locally owned and operated Highland Rim Speedway. Visit their website at highlandrim.com. Well, welcome back everybody to Pit Pass. Joe Williams and Larry Woody, and we talk about racing here, all types, uh, on Pit Pass. That's how you get into the pits. you got to have a pass. Yep. Larry can get one anywhere. Uh, eh, maybe not so much. But I did get one Saturday, Larry. Got to go up to Highland Rim Speedway up in Ridgetop where the Southern Superstars came to town. And I got to tell you, I've seen a lot of races in a lot of places, but this one was pretty much, uh, I'd call spectacular. Fast cars on a small track. On a small track. Started 21 cars in this thing. And quite frankly, Larry, interesting change, some interesting race procedures in that it was a 100-lap race. Yeah. Cautions counted up to five. Once they ran five caution laps, they froze the lap count. Yeah. Um, the real interesting thing was you could not go a lap down under caution. Yeah. They were just kind of cranking the leader's numbers out there. So you come in pits, and, and I, I understand why. They're trying to keep costs uh, down so you don't have to have a full pit yeah. crew to come and all this. But let me tell you. It may have been one of the most outstanding races I have seen. Two guys took off at the front, uh, Mark Day and Davey Coble. Now, Justin Ashburn sat on the pole, had some trouble uh, middle of the race. But by 80 laps, Larry, on this quarter-mile racetrack, Mark Day and Davey Coble had lapped the field under green. That's two pretty good uh, local racers, but Day I'm, and Coble. Oh, and you talk about 
just slicing and mm -hmm. putting on a clinic on how to pass inside and outside mm -hmm. on a quarter mile racetrack. Yep. Long story short, we get down to the last eh, seven, eight laps or so. The requirement that mm -hmm. the Southern All-Stars mm -hmm. has is that every, the last 10 laps have to be run under green flag conditions. Yep. Um, and it was every corner, every corner, um, there was uh, contact. And nobody put anybody in a wall or anything like that, but they moved each other. Day moved uh, Coble, Coble moved Day. It was a lot of fun to watch. You kind of wondered when the, when the temperature was going to go over. Uh, long story short, Coble wound up spinning down in one and two. Uh, seen a couple of angles. Maybe there was contact, maybe there wasn't. That's not for me to, to decide, but Coble spun. Long story short, Day wins the race, and uh, Chase Oliver out of Huntsville is second. Davy Coble winds up third. Larry, controversy is the crowd was split half and half. I mean, it was a great crowd. They were on their feet the last 10 laps uh, between Coble and Day, the two local favorites. And uh, victory for Mark Day. He's a three-time defending champion in this uh, particular group. He's a current points leader. A little controversy with the victory. And nothing wrong with that. You know, you're supposed to, the crowd's supposed to be on its feet on the, at the end of a race, and uh, one guy winning, and the guy who didn't win is supposed to be upset. That's Darlington could have used some of that the other day. <laughs> I, I said before, uh, Joe, I, I think Mark Day is the most talented driver to come through the old fairground speedway, through Middle Tennessee racing, not to have got a a big time career of any, anybody I've seen. He, he has the talent, and I asked, I've asked Mark about this, and he said, well, he sort of missed his chance back when he was younger and had some opportunities. He was content to race on this level, and he said, looking back, some, some regrets that he didn't maybe try a little harder to move up, but again, Mark Day has the talent. He could have, he could have done it if he had, had, had really wanted to, and as he'd said if, if himself, if he had pushed it a little harder. But no, I'm not surprised. Anytime they have a have a race around here and Mark Day wins, that's not <laughs> it's not, not a an big upset. Surprise to you. No, it's not an upset when Mark wins one. And, and like you said, Joe, it's not an upset when there might be just a little controversy around it. And now again, nothing wrong with that. Like Daryl used to say, it's stirring the pot, yep. and uh, racing can use its pot stirred once in a while. Again, going back to the snoozer at Darlington Saturday night, they could have used a little little Mark Day pot stirring over there. I'm, uh, uh, congratulations to Mark. He's a good, tough driver. And again, it's not an upset when Mark Day wins a race. Proud of both of them. After the race yeah. was over, uh, Davey um, communicated he was not extremely mm -hmm. happy. Uh, but both of the guys, yeah. you know, they did what they were supposed to do. They went to victory yeah. lane. They, they had all, you know, the top three were all together. And if it had been Everybody, flip flopped, if, if, oh, yeah. if, if Cobalt had been in, in victory lane and Mark had been spun out in the infield, he would have been happy either. So well, yeah. the, the, as, as uh, Bobby Allison said, the second place driver is just the first loser <laughs> to cross the finish line. <laughs> so they're not supposed to be happy yeah. when they lose. It, That's proud of both of them. I, I never liked, calm, kept I, cool. I, I never liked somebody who said they were tickled to finish second. Yeah. Was, yeah, it's hard to say that. Isn't not it? kind of. That's not exactly the point of racing all night to be content. But some of the Cup guys might take some lessons from that. I don't know. I think. So. Yeah, we'll get to that here in a minute. But um, only scheduled appearance for the Southern Superstars this year. Although I think the rim may uh, may be on tap to add a couple. I think they've got some, uh, the Southern All Stars have some open dates that uh, they may try to try to fill as they move across the southeast. The other big race. Uh, there were a couple of big races, but the other one. That really drew my attention. The uh, Tuners, wow, what a race! They they went out. The had who? A tuner division. Tuners, mm -hmm. T-U-N-E-R-S. Okay. The Tuners, where Zena Jenkins, despite damage to the front end, she got caught up in an accident, came back from the back, and Granny won again. She was our guest. She was one of our guests last week. Uh, out at the batter's box, and uh, you didn't call her Granny, I hope. Uh, she is trying to. Uh, I think she's put uh, put a hold on the website GoGranny.com. Actually, that I thought was, she preferred Zena the Warrior Princess. Well, to there's the, there's also that to the racing Granny. Yeah, well, there's also <laughs> my that old one. paper had a great <laughs> feature right. on her a while back. That's uh, right. She's a, she's a she's a character and a good racer too. Oh yeah, yeah. Toby, the old man Tobit, uh, who had been trailing her in points and trying to stay with her, uh, really car with. Cosmetically was not hurt, but boy, the whole rear end was knocked out of that thing. He got caught up in the same accident, wound up uh, pinched in the wall. So, you know, one of those things, Larry, the rim's always a lot of fun. They're off this weekend, but they'll be back uh, the 25th, March 25th. They go back to racing. And put on a heck of a show, again, not to beat 
Darlington to death, but how many times have they left, have fans left Highland Rim and said, man, what a boring race that was? I'll bet not many. Uh, I can guarantee you not many no, this no, year. No, I don't that think so. That hadn't happened this no, year I don't yet. think so. They, they put on a show at the rim. Yeah. A, lot of, a small place and a lot of fast cars going, going in a hurry. Yeah. We close out today with our weekly Mingus watch. Mason Mingus, second in the Arca Point Series, Larry, uh, was tied with uh, the ageless veteran, Frank Kimmel, mm -hmm. who is still racing. Yep. They, uh, they go to Toledo mm -hmm. this weekend, which will be the 18th. Uh, Mason went up and did a little testing earlier and feels very good about this one. They, they went to Toledo last year and he said, nah, kind of, kind of. They had a little practice session the other day and he's feeling a whole lot better about Toledo. So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll check back uh, next time and keep they, the Mason Mingus watch going. 18 year old from Brentwood and I think he's the next superstar from Middle Tennessee. Could very well be. No. Could very well be. But we'll see what happens. Uh, I'd like to see him have a good, Toledo's kind of his sort of racetrack. It's uh, a little bit more like Nashville where he's run before. That's such a great kid, as you know, Joe. Yeah. He's, he's not just a great racer, but he's a uh, talented racer. Just a really good kid. Yeah. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this edition of Pit Pass. Larry, as always, an honor to sit next to you. We'll do it again. Yeah, probably real soon. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do it real soon. Thank you so much for joining us. For Larry Woody, I'm Joe Williams. We'll see you next time on Pit Pass.